All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our second uh, roundtable for CES, Special Education Support Services for Brighton Center. My name is Alejandro Martinez. I'm a special education advocate and trainer, and I will serve as your host or facilitator for this evening. Um, tonight, we have a very special panel, very much like last time. We have our, our three advocates, myself included, from our program, and we have Nick Te Gonzalez, who is our also our assistant, um, our program assistant. She's fantastic and will have a lot to offer as well. Um, but first and foremost, I'd like to introduce uh, our panel for tonight. We have Girasol Margain, who is uh, an advocate as well with, with Brighton Center, advocate and trainer. She has been with uh, Brighton for 13 years now, um, has five kiddos, several with, with special needs, and has navigated the special education system for a long time. So she has a lot to offer, not only as a parent, but as an advocate, and we're, we're excited to have her again this evening. I'd also like to introduce uh, Juan Hernandez, an, another colleague of mine. Um, again, two kiddos with special needs, has navigated the system for a, a very long time as well, and happy to have you this evening as well, my friend. Good to see you. See the beard has been growing nice and full. And last but not least, again, like I mentioned, Nick Te Gonzalez, she's our program assistant. She is the glue that keeps our program together. Ladies and gentlemen, if you ever have the privilege of calling our, our line, she will be the person to answer and she is fantastic. She will set you up with an appointment to see our beautiful faces virtually or to talk to us uh, through email. So thank you, Nick Te, for everything that you do. Um, now that I've introduced everybody, I just kind of want to go over our agenda this evening. So we have um, some notes here to, to guide us along the way. But really primarily tonight, three things that we really want to dive deep into. And the first one is going to be talking about what everyone has been doing, meaning everyone, Girasol, Nikte, uh, Juan, who have children with special needs, have been doing distance learning, have been navigating the system. We talked about a couple of things that they've been doing on their own uh, through this pandemic. I want to hear what, what has been working and what hasn't, because I'm sure things have somewhat worked. I'm sure things haven't worked at all, and I'm sure that you've come up with your own things. So I'm really interested to hear about that to kind of give our audience a perspective of what's been working, what hasn't. Then I kind of want to move into a conversation about um, just what families can do to prepare for the, the rest of the school year, knowing full well that it's going to be a mix of, of, of in, in person learning, maybe not so much, and some distance learning. Uh, what can our families do? You know, uh, I think that's a big question that everybody has is, is with everything up in the air, what can we control? And as someone who has suffered from mental health issues and anxiety and depression, with anxiety comes that that lost sense of control. And I'm sure a lot of us are, are experiencing that. So I think that giving some families some pointers as far as what they can control in the special education process, I think that can help um, a lot of families along the way. But again, we have a lot of great things to talk about this evening. I'm super excited. I'm amped up. I'm, I'm excited to talk to you guys tonight. And so let's get started. And I'm going to go with, with Hirasol first because, again, not only has Hirasol been working for Brighton Center for quite a bit of time now, not only as a teacher, she started out as a teacher in our early education program, but as an advocate now. And then obviously at home, she's also a fantastic parent, a uh, parent of five beautiful children, all of which have different needs. And, it, you know, when everybody thinks about special education uh, that, that isn't really in the know, they think of this umbrella and they don't think about the nuances that come with special education. And I think that, that with Hirasol, again, you have a, a very distinct uh, situation at home, a very unique situation. And I really want to get your thoughts on a couple of things that have been working, a couple of things that you might have talked about last time and, and what really has worked for you, what has not, and maybe some advice that you could offer to our parents. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the great introduction, Alex. 
And yes, as far as you know, all of the concerns that we've been discussing since the last roundtable to this one, um, there are some things that have worked really well and some things that didn't. So we're here to kind of share them and see what works for you and how we can better prepare. So from the five children that I have, I'm going to talk about uh, my third grader. She is a kiddo who has a specific learning disability in reading and the dyslexia program is, is really what has helped us during this distance learning. Um, from the end of the last year, when we went through distance learning, we re realized that the Zoom meetings that she was having, she had lots of them. Um, she had one for reading, one for writing, one for math, one for dyslexia specifically, some special education interventions from her teachers, and there was just a lot. But what she benefited the most was that direct interaction within the Zoom meetings. Um, there were, we seem to have a lot of great um, communication between the staff and I. I you know, encourage all the families and so do my uh, two co-workers is communicate, you know, take data, email your teacher, make sure that you're on the same page so that your child can uh, make that good progress. So that constant communication, that email, class dojo, whatever it is that you're using, just make sure that you're communicating and letting them know what is working for your for your child. Um, knowing my, my daughter is, is really what helps me and it helps me know what her limits are and when I am able to push her a little bit more, um, know when I can tell the teachers keep pushing and when we need to kind of give her a little bit of, of a break or if we had to just change the, the way that the distance learning was and give her those difficult subjects that she, she has challenges in and the areas during the day where she's the most happy and excited and then you know, or even if it had to be in the evening. So we did realize that some things that didn't work at all was um, the fact that she felt very overwhelmed when she had lots more meetings than her siblings. She had five meetings a day and siblings had one to two meetings during the week. So that difference uh, made her feel a little bit upset and overwhelmed. So just kind of validating her feelings and letting her know that, you know, we're working through this together. I sat with her through those meetings, um, but she did need a lot of emotional support and academic support. So we had to kind of just make sure that we were providing a little bit of both. Um, she had lots of assignments in her Google Classroom, so we kind of had to decide and prioritize which ones were the ones that we were going to be completing, even if we had to change a little bit of what the assignment was going to look like and then let the, you know, the staff know that some she was not going to complete. We, I wasn't going to put her through that stress if it wasn't even going to be graded or if she demonstrated the knowledge for what the material was, even if she wasn't, you know, she was asked, you know, answering verbally or if she was just telling me I would write it down for her just to kind of help her. Um, we, I realized that her accommodations that she has at school, they needed to be implemented even here at home. So that that verbal praise, the time, the extra time to respond, you know, she may seem like she's not paying attention, but it's more of that processing time that, you know, it gives you the impression that she's not paying attention. And we forget that it's not that, it's just she needs that extra time to process and to finish her work. Um, so we had to figure out some different, you know, preferred sitting arrangements and some fidget items that, you know, his, her sensory box when it came home, um, you know, and, and what worked the most was giving her those multiple breaks and just allowing her to take those breaks. Um, for my high schooler, Ricardo, he um, was very, very different during the distance learning. Nothing that we had tried worked. So it was kind of, you know, upsetting that everything that we kept trying was not working. I had to let the staff know, hey, we were trying, nothing is working. He's pretty upset and, you know, he's engaging in um, some self Interest behaviors. It's because it's it's too too drastic of a change for us to require him to work with academics at home. So we looked at what can we do, and we we worked on activities of daily living, something purposeful for him. Made those activities you know fun and used them. Maybe if he was sorting items, you know, used them in the bathtub so that he could see it as a play, um, but not as a you know required academic task. Um, which is just, you know, kind of helping him build a routine and, and engaging during the day and kind of giving him some some breaks as well. Um, so we kind of just went with whatever was helping, whatever was was working and felt free to adjust. And during that that time of adjustment, I just made sure that I was documenting by emailing the staff and letting them know this is working this week and maybe the same thing was not working the next week. So just keeping them in the loop 
and see if they had extra ideas or if not, I came up with my own and just made sure that everybody was on the same page. So. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, a couple observations from what you were telling me, and I think that, that it's really, um, really fascinating. So with with um, with your third grader, it was more like she she was requiring more of direct interaction with her teacher. You know, uh, she was needing more communication, more feedback. Uh, you also had to think more outside the box as a parent. Um, take kind of the ownership as a teacher and implement things and change things on the fly to, to make sure that you were accommodating for for your daughter and then thinking about what what different accommodations or maybe what existing accommodations work and I feel like that is completely a, a contrast to what you had to do for Ricardo which was more of like hey nothing that you guys were doing or that was working in school is working now so you have to flip the whole thing around and like kind of throw the table over and, and start new. And I think that that's one of the, the like key things that we'll talk about more about uh, this evening is how parents need to think about school in a completely new light. It, it, it's a new normal. Um, school as we knew it has completely changed. Um, more as it is, you know, we think about like distance learning as a new mode of learning, but now as, as parents, we have to also think about ourselves as part of that community even more, even more so than before, about being integrated with, with our teachers and, and really forming that partnership to teach our, our kids the most effective way possible. I mean, what you're telling me is, is, is essentially that, like, there was a lot of heavy lifting on your part, one, because you really understand the process and you, you live it, um, but two, because also I, it almost seems like district or the district that your children are in were almost willing more so than in the past to work with you. And I think that we have to keep that in mind as well, that this is a time where everybody needs to think outside the box. But, you know, we'll get into that a little bit more. But what I find fascinating is that what what was working for one kiddo doesn't work at home and what maybe didn't work or was working does work for another. So again, very interesting. I think that, that that's that's a really good um, picture to paint for for the people listening this evening and, and that will maybe listen to this down the line. Maybe, you know, um, this transmission's going off in space somewhere and, you know, anyway, <laughs> um, very cool. Uh, this makes me like really amped up because I, I think that, that families a lot of times are very scared to deviate from the plan or say, oh, I, I don't want to do this because I don't want to screw it up or I, I don't want to uh, not go with what what the teacher is telling me. But I think that it, it's the opposite. I think parents need to follow their instincts, see what their parent, what the kiddos are telling them, right? What what feedback they're getting from their kids and, and work together and, and more so than ever. I said it last time. You know, it used to take uh, uh, a village. Now it's going to take a city to really help our, our kiddos. So thank you, Kidasol, for for providing that that input. Um, now I want to move on to Juan. Uh, Juan, uh, your kiddos, a little bit different circumstances. Your household, a little bit different. Uh, let us know what's been working for you. You know, last time we talked, um, you know, maybe some things were working, maybe some things were not. But I want to hear your perspective. What's been working, what hasn't? And maybe do you have a couple of words of advice for our, our families? All right, yeah, so an update from Hernandez ISD. Um, I'm very, very happy with the way that things ended up uh, going for us. For uh, my daughter, Sinovia, uh, who is gonna be a high schooler. Well, they're both gonna be high schoolers just next month, which is scary. But for her, we really felt that she was going to benefit a lot from the, the the Zoom or Google Classroom and, you know, meeting with the teacher on, on video. But she actually had the opposite effect. She did not want to be on video with teachers. She didn't want to be on video with therapists. She didn't want to be on video with anybody. She just felt, I guess, pressure, you know, and just she didn't respond well to it. So we had to let her really set her own I guess little bubble of how she was going to learn, right? We we got input from her and I think giving her that control helped her out and motivated her. She was 
practicing, I guess what they've labeled as the asynchronous method where she was doing things at her own pace. Um, she knew how to get into Google Classroom. We'd get in every Monday. She'd go down the list of the different assignments that had been posted and she'd pick out, you know, the order of assignments that she was going to do. And her teachers were pretty good about saying these were due on most of the time they would do Friday, but they would give us a due date of when everything was expected. And from time to time, sometimes it would deviate from that plan, but she was really good at adjusting and just falling into place. She she really stepped up in that in that aspect. And then, like I said, given her the option of being in control and choosing how she was going to do her assignments, we saw a lot of success. We didn't need to provide a lot of support, so to speak, but we did have to provide, you know, breaks and tell her, you know, hey, baby, why don't you take a break? You know, you could tell that she was typing a little bit harder. She was getting a little frustrated. So we had to, you know, kind of prompt her, tell her, hey, why don't you take a break? Um, and, and you know what, overall, though, uh, she did very well. Uh, well, my son Santana, her older brother by 11 months, um, also going to be a high schooler. I, I had my doubts. I was scared about what telehealth and, and online school was going to look like. I, I, I had my doubts and he shut me up real fast. I didn't take into account that this guy has just, he's been through a lot and he has adjusted and he has overcome a lot. I also didn't take into account the, the phenomenal team that he has, you know, that, that, that backs him up, that backs us up. Um, we did continue with telehealth services with him. Um, and I say telehealth because for him, he does attend school, but he goes to the autism treatment center for school. So it's a little different. Now he does have his IEP and they do follow that IEP. They do track, you know, the goals and, and his mastery progress towards those goals. So everything is just like, you know, your traditional school is just in a more specialized setting for, for him with his autism. We had, um, Two meetings, and then this is still happening now throughout the summer. Two meetings a week, you know. They the the on Tuesdays it's a meeting for my wife and I with the teacher, with the therapist, with the we have you know a, a BCBA, we have an RBT, we have you know all kinds of different therapists that meet with us and really are training us through this whole thing. I feel like it's just been one big collection of parent training, you know. And I think that that's something that you know, and I know we'll get to that but I want to tell parents really push for parent training because you are the teacher now. So with, with us, they really just, I mean, they did a phenomenal job of showing us the, the little details of what to do, right? Do this or don't do that. Or how about we try this? You know, they were nice with us, even though they probably could have gotten after us because we are mom and dad. And sometimes our kiddos can get over on us. Um, but Overall, it, it went really well for the meetings that he would be on camera. We would, you know, log in from our phones and we would put the phone so that they could see him, but he could not see them. If he could see them or even himself, he was more distracted by that and wouldn't do his work. When he didn't see them, they were able to see him work. They sent us packets. They sent us data sheets. We have a Google Drive where we share data sheets back and forth. They send us new ones and we send them back to them filled out. We've set up a data collection system. They trained us on that. They trained us on, you know, what to do, what not to do. Um, they've troubleshot with us throughout the whole process. I mean, they've done a phenomenal job. And it was a lot of work on our part. Uh, it was a lot of us really learning how to do things now versus how we used to do things. And I feel that overall, as a parent, as a professional, as an advocate, it's helped me develop my skills and helped me, you know, really enhance now my repertoire for what I, how I can help other, other families, you know, and it really, I really can't, you know, speak enough to them. But, you know, one of the main things with Santana is that we, we didn't push our luck, right? If he was on edge, we would work through some of those behaviors, but we left it in small chunks and worked with him because that's what he can handle. And we didn't push it. You know, we got the results that we wanted. We got the data we wanted and we just worked with them and we just sort of adjusted from there. But overall, you know, we ended up on a good note. We've been working with him throughout the summer and looking forward to what this year will bring. That's fantastic. And, and it, you know, what's interesting again, uh, a couple things though, because Juan, 
you know, obviously you your kids are a little bit older with, you know, in in comparison to Hira Souls, especially especially with, um, you know, Tana and Novi, like, you know, Novi's going to high school this year. Tana's right behind, uh, you know, giving control. And I think that that's that's super important as well. You know, when of it, when possible, you know, allowing your children to to own their education as well during these times, because, you know, as things continue to change, they might have to be in situations where maybe mom and dad aren't going to be around as much and like being over their shoulder. And I think that's important to to start really implementing that with kids. Like, hey, you have to own your education when possible, obviously given the circumstances on your education you have to be a responsible young young person and 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 take advantage of that and and really grow up in that sense so i think that i'm really glad that you brought that up Juan. like that you're able to to give control to your child and, and really allow them to own their education um being hands-on you know that's that's super important as well and and I, i'm really glad that you brought that up because you know thinking outside the box and again we all as parents have to think outside the box on how we're going to approach education until this this pandemic really gets under control and i think that it, it, it we are so concerned about doing the right thing sometimes that we freeze and we don't actually help our children we actually hurt them because we are so concerned about doing the right thing that we're not really servicing them the right way and allowing them to be um you know to really grow up in, in an academic sense and do things that maybe that that aren't necessarily tied to like your standard teaks or what the school wants you to learn but just like practical life skills you know just allowing your kids to to fold the laundry or you know put the groceries away things like that you know that's also academic and in these times i would argue that these types of skills are more valuable than two plus two you know what i mean so um really cool that that you know different approaches between you and Hirasol, the ages and the way that you're also adapting to this you know it's not just you're not just letting this kind of go by and then taking the school's directive because the school doesn't know what they're doing and it's not their fault ta doesn't know what they're doing so it's really um i think a big takeaway so far of this conversation is that we have to take us as parents, we have to take the bull by the horns and really own the education process as much as we can, as much as we're able to um, within the circumstances and working in, in partnership with our schools. But I think fantastic points that, that both you and Hita Sol have made. Sorry, I'm looking down at my notes. I don't want to expose you to, to some of my thinning hair aspects here. But again, um, and a data collection system. I love it. I think that, and we'll talk about more of this uh, as we go on in this conversation because we're all data knobs, snobs, sorry, knobs. Uh, we're all data snobs here uh, and we love data. So having a, a data collection system and there's no right or wrong way to collect data as we've all uh, talked about in our presentations and not. So thank you Juan for sharing your perspective. Now I wanna move on to Nick Tay because again, uh, we're blessed to have different perspectives in this group. And, and Nick Tay, uh, your son is my client. Yes, uh, he is one of my clients. And um, her son's three, by the way, or four. He's four now. Almost four. Almost four. He'll be four soon. Um, but Nick Tay, had, if, if you were with us last conversation, Nick Tay is navigate, was navigating this the special education process for the first time with, with Alejandro, her, her son, um, and a lot was thrown on her plate from the onset, right? Like it, it takes a lot to to be a parent navigating these waters for the first time ever. And then you you throw a pandemic, you know, in the wrench, you put that wrench into the, the spokes and it's it's difficult. And and I really want to hear from you, Nick Tay, what's been working, what hasn't, has the school reached out to you? Uh, what are some things that maybe the school has met, met you in the middle? Maybe things that you've had to think outside the box to to approach your own circumstance at home. Give us a little insight in uh, Casa Gonzalez. Yeah, so um, over here, what we've been doing, um, it took us a little bit to kind of get in in the groove of things. Um, I had to work with my son too. I mean, he's little, so he wasn't understanding why he 
stop going to school abruptly. He loved going to school. Um, so that was a big hurdle. He was having some behaviors because he, you know, he wanted to go out and he still does, but I think, and I feel bad because I think at this point he thinks I'm keeping him hostage. Um, yeah. he's not understanding, but, um, but you know, he's, um, we, we created, a a visual schedule for him to follow and it, and it's, you know, it's not the same as he had in school, but he at least knows that, you know, we, we follow a pattern. And since we've been spending so much time at home, it's just the time that we weren't in school, the summer break that he had, um, we still followed a little routine for him um, to not, you know, to not go, to not lose track of that. And then um, the school has reached out. His teachers were very good. Um, when it when the the school first closed, they you know they would do weekly, um, twice a week meetings, and then um, you know just check on him every day, send him handouts, make sh making sure that I understood you know if I had time, if I had any questions for him. Um, even his therapist also reached out. Um, and then we did set him up with um, with some makeup services um, in the summer. He just finished those, um, so he did do some speech therapy these past uh, weeks. It was virtual, and he he does do well with with virtual. Thankfully, um, he is one of those kids that was just born with, you know, the he just knows how to work technology, and so. Um, thankfully, that has worked to his advantage because he sees the the speech therapist, or he has he, he was seeing his teacher, and he would learn from that. He was still picking up. So, thankfully, we haven't really missed a step except when it came to a little bit of behaviors and a little bit of trouble understanding what was going on. But you know, once like I said, once we got into the groove of things, we're we're good. And I I'm I mean I have high hopes for this coming school year um, that will you know, we'll keep that up. We'll keep up that pace and, and you know, he he'll keep on learning because he's improved a lot. Even in the past three weeks that he had supplementary um, services, um, he improved a lot. So it, it was shocking to me to to see that. So I'm glad I'm glad that he's that kind of kid. But I know I mean, I only have one and it was hard at the beginning, so I don't know. I mean, I'm sure everybody's going to have their own struggles. No, for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, one thing, Nick Day, that um, I think that is worth mentioning is, you know, in Alejandro's case, super bright kiddo, nonverbal at the moment, but he's super um, adaptable to technology, right? So, like, working to, towards his strengths. And I think that as parents, we need to think about that going into the next school year is what can we do to kind of let the the art committee or, or our kids team special education team understand where our kids needs are presently because they've completely changed since march and that's just always kind of the deal right like our kids are always going to change but the expectation is usually from from may or june um to august september now you know we've, we're talking about kids that have been out of school for five months um so it, it's really an interesting conversation and again we'll, we'll we'll definitely dive more deep into this but um now that you've had your children at home kira juan nikte you know you've understood more about probably where your kids are um academically one but what works for them what doesn't work for them and then what is continuing to work for them in this setting and you can bring all of that information to the art committee and, and have some of these things implemented in the IEP moving forward. And I think that for me as an outsider listening to these stories and, and really getting a sense of where you guys are coming from, that's a big takeaway for me. If I'm going into the school, this new school year, and I'm thinking about, well, what can I do? What can I control? is providing this data, right? Writing it down and saying like, this is where my kid is at now. This is where my kid was at maybe in March, but as of September or maybe late August, you know, this is where he's at. Please try to meet my kid here, right? And and obviously 
there's a trepidation or there's this like inherent um, kind of weariness about school because school always wants to meet your child where your child's not at. They want to meet your child at at Z where he's at like he or she might be at, you know, A. Um, so again, we'll, we'll dive more deeply into what you guys can do, you meaning the, the people listening to um, what we're saying right now, uh, the audience, the thousands of people that are listening right now. But um, very cool. And then thank you for sharing your perspective, Nick Day. Uh, I always value how diverse this group is. You know, I'm a very fortunate that that I have amazing colleagues that that have these perspectives because I, as a former educator and as a parent, I learned so much from you guys. So thank you so much for for always just being you. You guys are awesome. Um, I do want to get to so Jorge Aragon. He has a question here, and I, I want to set time aside towards the end to answer live questions. So Jorge, uh, I'm not ignoring your question. I just want to. We will answer your question. You'll probably get more answers than you want because we're very willing and able to, to give you answers. But I want to uh, set our, our kind of like Q&A part towards the, the latter half of, of our uh, roundtable this evening. But I, I, I want to quickly sweat, segue into like, you know, this idea of what should families expect from schools and what can families do to prepare for the school year? And this is a really daunting question because, again, there's more unanswered questions uh, than there are answers. And each district is kind of doing something different. TA is kind of saying something different. The CDC is saying something different. It seems like every day we get something different. So every day we live in a new reality and it's hard to prepare for a new reality when there's a new reality because you don't even have time to blink. My question to you guys, and again, throwing up the ball. What can parents do right now? What can they do to prepare? And especially, man, parents are, are working full time. You know, most of us are working full time. Uh, most of us have multiple kids to, to look after. What, what can parents do to prepare? Uh, what can they do and what can they implement and what can they start doing now to make sure that, that they're in a good place? Um, just wanted to, you know, share my thoughts on this. I feel that, you know, as a parent, not only an advocate, but as a parent of children who have disabilities and all of the, the families who are going through this with us, we, we kind of live this every day since our children were born. They, we, we don't know what to expect. Something comes up. We have a new diagnosis. Now they have medical needs. Now they have, we have new behaviors. So I think we have a very good experience in knowing that we're going to get past this. We know that there's this new norm, everybody says, but for us, it's just the next chapter and the next, you know, thing that we're going to um, challenge and we're going to get past it and we're going to figure out with those resources and, and talk to the people that are going to give us some good guidance and, and we're going to move past this. So in, in a way, I think that if anybody is ready for, you know, school to start and and to take on this challenge, it's us, the parents of kids with disabilities. So some of the just quick tips that I'm gathering for myself and for my family is just pretty much determining who is gonna be here at home supporting my kids, whether, you know, because I do have to work and I do have to work from home, but you know, what is the schedule gonna look like? Can I, you know, have a split shift? Can I have some uh, morning hours and then can I work, you know, and, and support my kids at school and then work in the evening and, and kind of see what that's gonna look like, um, determining that with your, with your job and with the kids and, and the staff and see how can we fix that? Um, some parents are going to have to go back to work, you know, and, and I know it's difficult because we're expecting this, the kids to go to school, but at this point, what are the options? You know, if you're working from home, who's going to be, you know, helping you? And if not, then reaching out to the school and saying, you know, I have to work and that's just the way it is. So what can we work out? Can we have evening? You know, can we get, you know, the, the assignments done at the end of the school uh, week? Or what does that look like? Kind of just collaborating. Teachers are also parents, so they're also going through the same exact, you know, fears and, and struggles that we are. So I'm sure that there, there's a way that we can kind of communicate and let them know, you know, where we are so that we can kind of work together. 
Um, but as far as at home, you know, the same thing that we did through distance learning is, is creating some kind of non-distracting, comfortable area so that your kid acknowledges that that's the school time, that's it. there's a table, it's not, you know, in front of the couch watching TV so that it's not so um, unproductive and, and it's challenging for us to engage our kids in, in schoolwork. We can't have them in front of the computer for eight hours. Um, but if we have them just for a little bit and kind of go back and forth, acknowledging the accommodations that they have in place th through their IEP um, and, and kind of finding out, you know, with your child, where are they at? Talking to them and letting them know, okay, this is what, what the new um, way of school is going to be for a little bit and, and see what their fears are and see if we can address any of those things so that they're more willing to participate in, in, in getting that schoolwork um, done prioritizing those assignments, also talking to the staff and saying we're, we're not going to look at, you know, just keeping our kids busy. It's more of what do we need to get done? You know, is it a practice? Is this a new skill? Um, do we need to have those face to face interactions um, via uh, a meeting or is this something that our kids can read and we can kind of go from there? Kind of just making sure that at all times we're documenting and sending emails, taking data just so that we know what is working and what is not working and that there's some kind of paper trail with with um, the communication that we have with the staff at, at school um, for new ways of practicing something or things that are not going to definitely work for us. So that would be my my point on this question. Perfect. You know, as as parents of children with with special needs, you know, adversity is our norm. I mean, that is just like that's the most poignant like kind of thing that, that I got from that is we're used to this, right? We're used to, to having to, to climb mountains and, and really move mountains to, to get what we need for our kiddos. And more than ever, parents, we have to dig deep and we have to really um, research when we're tired, when we're going to sleep, when we don't want to do it, like really dig deep and find those moments to, to learn learn about the system, learn about the laws, learn about um, what our kids needs really are at this moment. And I really like you know, so that you mentioned is, is, you know, opening that dialogue with your with your children if possible and, and talking about what's working for you, what's not, what are you afraid of? What are you uh, scared of outside of obviously this COVID thing that is very palpable? What about going back to school or what about not going back? It's, back to school that, that kind of freaks you out because it's scary to think about going to school when not going to school and not having mom and dad really being available throughout the day like having those conversations if possible is huge um, and then parents again it's really any moment that you can find to to get some of those answers or to research something is huge because again there's nothing in law and we're all again data nerds there's nothing in law, and we've all are very well versed in law, but there's nothing in law that says we can't think outside the box and how we can educate our children, especially during this pandemic. I mean, uh, schools were doing this back in March, sending these continuity plans, and they were just sticking things on a piece of paper. They were throwing doo doo on a wall and saying, look, whatever sticks and works, works. Well, there's nothing in law that says you can't do the same, parents. You can throw some doo doo up back on the wall and say, you know what? This dude have been working in my house. I work in your house too. So, um, love it. Um, Juan, I want to go to you. Like, what what do you have for parents in terms of of what can they expect? What can they do to prepare? Like, what are some things they can take control of right now to to make sure that their kids are are serviced the appropriate way moving into the school year? Yeah. So, first and foremost, for parents. Be ready, expect change, uncertainty. Things are gonna be up and down um, probably for a while. So get ready for that now. Uh, we can't control that. So try not to give that too much of your stress. Just approach it from a, a standpoint of, okay, what am I gonna do now, right? Start coming up with a plan and um, you're gonna have to get creative, reach out, and like Alex said, you know, it's it's about creating that village and creating that support system. You want to make sure that you have people around you that are also going through the same thing, but also people that are not people that you can just sort of unwind with and, you know, take care of, you know, your needs and, and your stressors. Um, but 
first and foremost, like, and, and he's been saying it, data, data, data. We document everything. Create journals, create notebooks, whatever it is that you can create, write everything down. Record whatever you can. Use your phone, use, you know, whatever you can, and, and video as much as you can, right? Journal, document, video, it, all of that information is data, okay? A big thing that we're in a unique situation where if you look at the questions in the, or you look at the goals in the IEP and you see where it says with no more than certain amount of prompts, right? If you have a child that has to formulate a letter and they get helped one time hand over hand, that's one prompt. That child cannot do that if they need that help, right? So now parents are starting to see, well, they said that my child is able to do this and able to do that, but their child cannot without those prompts, without hand over hand, without uh, verbal prompts, verbal cues, right? So now we're starting to see what our children could do independently and 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 we approach, reevaluate, and go in there and start updating what the IEP is actually measuring. Another major thing that I mentioned earlier was parent training. Parent training is gonna be one of the biggest things that we do this year because you're now the teacher. So good luck, right? Um, you're going to have to figure it out. You're going to have to be creative. You're going to have to collaborate and do your research. Like like Alex said, you're going to have a lot of sleepless, sleepless nights trying to figure out what it is that you're doing. But you have a team here that is more than willing to help you out, coach you through this, and really make sure that you get the best for your kiddo. Um, establish a data collection system between you and the school. Uh, Google Drive, you've got... Dropbox, you've got, you know, different things, even just taking pictures of data forms that you collect, right? I've, once you've been trained on collecting data and then just texting that over to the teachers or to whoever it is that's helping you out, the case manager. Um, but but make sure that you're communicating. Communicating is going to be a big deal uh, throughout this entire thing. Establish routines, assign your kiddos roles and responsibilities throughout their school day, but also just in our everyday, you know, workings of our house, the everyday routine, because it takes their mind off of that whole, you know, we're in a pandemic and we're cooped up in this house, you know, but if they know they have responsibilities, it gives them sort of that sense of worth, you know, um, that purpose during the day. They're not just thinking of, of all the negative, but they're, you know, engaged in, um, in other things. Cut them some slack, cut you some slack, all right? Don't think that Everything's going to be perfect because it is not. Everything is not perfect here. I can hear jumping upstairs. Don't know what it is, but right now, you're not my kiddo. You'll be my kiddo again in about an hour. So that's where that whole, you know, tagging in with uh, whoever else is your support and making sure that they can uh, help you out comes into play. But yeah, guys, things are not going to be perfect. Collaborate, communicate, reach out, get help. Don't do this alone. Do not do this alone. Make sure you have your circle of people that can support you. And that's for now what I have. No, I think that that's fantastic, Juan. Um, big takeaways from what you said, Juan, that really resonated with me. Obviously, the don't do this alone. Uh, that's a huge one uh, because I think a lot of us in this in this program i think all of us as advocates we don't like to ask for help because we like to help people so um i know for sure myself i don't like to ask for help um and i think now more than ever it's okay to ask for help uh in any aspect of what's going on in your life but you know we're talking about special education in general i think it have a team have a support reach out to people reach out to strangers reach out to face group groups, reach out to support groups, reach out to Brighton, write me an email. I'll answer. You know, I'm on my computer randomly at one in the morning. I'll answer. I will give you the the CES email hotline. Hit me up. I'll, I'll write you back. <laughs> uh, anyone else, you know, like reach out to people. Don't do this alone. I think that that really resonates with me. Um, you know, I had, uh, unfortunately, I, I had uh, a, my college roommate, his father passed away today and he's, he's uh, you know, he's doing this alone. You know, he has no other family, his, his father passed away. So that really resonates with me this evening. So thank you Juan for bringing that up. You know, don't do these things alone. 
Uh, it's okay to ask for help. And I think more than ever, we need to normalize that concept that it's okay to ask for help. We're all uh, vulnerable. Uh, parent trainings, that's a huge one. I think more than ever, as parents of, of kiddos that are receiving special education services, we need to take advantage of what is, is, is presented by law that we can take advantage of. And a lot of it is those parent trainings asking, well, hey, district, you wanting me to be the teacher, what kind of, of opportunities are you going to offer me as, as essentially the customer? Um, what are you going to offer me to help my kid? I mean, you, you can't be expected to do it alone. It, it, it should have never been that way, and it, and it isn't. And again, more so now than ever, parents need support. So really parents out there really harp on the school and really ask and really stick it to them and ask, you know, what kinds of parent training offerings do the districts have in terms of, of um, distance learning? And I, that's a question that I've been asking since March, since this whole thing started is, you know, every district I ask, what are your plans for rolling out a robust uh, parent training? So fantastic one. And then obviously we've all kind of talked about it, but establishing a, a data collection system. Again, there's nothing, there's no right or wrong system, whether you're taking a video, whether you're writing things down, whether you're finger painting on something, uh, writing it in pudding. Um, <laughs> I'm hungry. I'm sorry um, for, for dessert. Um, write it, write it down, write it on a sticky note, write it anywhere. There's not a wrong way to, to collect data and, and, and there's no way to, no wrong way to present it. There's one right way to do it and it's in an ARD meeting and you can call for that at any time. So boom. All right, Nick Tay, before we get into some, um, I want to go back to a couple things that, that everybody has said, but I want to get Nick Tay's perspective because again, completely different situation. Nick Tay, your, your kiddo is almost like a month. You're like a month. Uh, my kiddo and your kiddo are like a month apart. So I, I kind of have lived some of what you're living. And I want to kind of get your perspective on what do you think parents can do to prepare for the next year? And what do you think like that's worked for you right now for preparing? Like, is there anything that you've done that, that makes you feel OK about stepping into the unknown? I think what has helped me. Um, I guess step into the unknown, how you said is. I've already made my decision that we're going to do virtual learning. And so I'm preparing for that. We are still preparing in the way that we would if it was a, a typical school year, getting supplies that he's going to need, getting clothes that he's going to need. Um, but but really um, just kind of like the mental part of it has been a big thing for us here. I mean, we we know that school is coming. We know how we're going to do school. <clears throat> so. So we're just going to take it from there. And of course, because he had he had those um, those services these past weeks, it kind of established a new routine and kind of got his mind going a little bit in, in that, I guess, in that setup of Oh, you know, we're starting school, we're doing this. And actually his teachers send a packet over the summer, you know, so he could work on it over the summer. And so when we don't when we weren't doing those speech services, we were doing we were using that hour or half an hour to work on on the paperwork that they gave him, which is like tracing letters, um, counting and all that stuff. And so I am taking data because he, you know, he had a goal, some goals of learning numbers from 1 to 10, um, but when he came home, he was already identifying 30s, 40s, 50s. And so I I wrote that down and I mentioned it to the to the teachers and so we we updated his goal and stuff. And so that's just something that I've been keeping track of. So that way I know what we're coming in with in the next school year. So that's another part of the prep work that we're doing. We just need to know where we're at, what we need, and how we're going to go about it. That, that's great. I think that. Man, and it, again. You guys always surprise me, but I think that what Nick Tay is saying is that, you know, her and her family have made that decision to say, you know what, regardless of, of 
in-person school or asynchronous or whatever, synchronous, blah, blah, blah. We're going to do virtual because as a family, we're drawing that red line and we're making that decision. And I, I really love that because as parents, you should feel empowered to make those calls. You don't have to wait on the district. The district's already saying that they're going to provide options to you. They don't say, you know, well, if you take this option A, B, C, they're just saying we're going to give you guys options. You have the power, guys, parents, you have the, the, the power to, to really dictate how this thing goes because we're, we're kind of in uncharted waters and it's not like they rewrote IDA law. They didn't rewrite the law and say, well, you know, like overnight, your, your child can't be serviced through a pandemic. No, that hasn't happened. So the fact that, Nick Tay, you, you're saying, I'm going to go ahead and take the liberty to take that offer, right? And I'm going to make that, that decision and I'm going to start prepping now. That's fantastic because it really puts the ball in your court and you can kind of manipulate how the situation works out in your favor. And I really like that. And I think that it can work both ways. If you're the kind of parent that says, you know what, I'm out, I'm weighing the pros and cons and going back to school because I think there is value in going back to person school. I am one of those that, that, that does think that there is value. And I do think there is value in distance learning because obviously we've heard from three different perspectives and from all three perspectives, there's been pros and cons to both. And, and honestly, I would I would have thought that for a lot of your situation, guys, you would have, you know, I would have. I, I was thinking I'm going to hear it's all bad news for distance learning, but it's been positive, you know, and I think that that parents, you have the option of saying, you know what, even if I do go back to school, these are the kinds of things that I would like to see. And, and again, you, there's no right and wrong right now. As long as you're staying within the scope of your of your child's needs and you're staying within the scope of the law, there's no wrong and there's no right. There's only a matter of of the school working with you in tandem as they ought, should always be working with you in tandem to work collaboratively to service your child to give them the education that they are entitled to per federal law so again i love it i love it that we have three different perspectives three different ideas of, on how things should go and i love the fact really nick Day, that last part resonated with me because i've always been a very uh big proponent of of being an active participant in your reality right not letting things happen to you kind of just stepping in and saying you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna go in there and wreck things up i'm gonna be a, a bull in a china shop and i'm gonna say you know what if they kick me out whatever but maybe they like how i break things so they'll let me stay awesome uh i think that's important to, to keep in mind families there's nothing wrong uh there's no way, wrong way to approach the situation and if you have any doubts, you have someone like Brighton in your corner to, to help you through this thing. So fantastic. That, that makes me happy. Um, OK, guys, so we have a couple of questions in the chat. Is there anything before we dive into those that we, we want to go back to? Um, I know that I had a couple of things here that I wanted to get back to uh, real quick. So this whole idea of data collection, and I know we've been kind of harping on it. Uh, and there's no right and wrong way. We, I've already kind of stressed that point, but I really want to get down to the crux of the like the why, right? Like why why data collection and why so much during this time? Why more than ever is it important to have a data collection system? Um, and again, I'm going to throw up this 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 tee ball to you guys because I think this is an easy home run, but. We always talk about data collection. Why now more than ever? Why is it important? Just like in school, whenever traditional school is, is in place, you know, data drives everything. And, and what data does, it tells us what our children are able to do and what they need some help with, right? What they need, uh, what their areas of need are. We are now in a unique position, you know, because before we used to have to depend on you know that the very beginning of the IEP where they say the present levels uh, we had that that was pretty much our summary in the progress reports of what our children could do well now we are able to see it firsthand you know we work with them we take the IEP look at the accommodations that are there and then implement those ourselves um, or just freestyle it because we've done that most of the time too but you can see what the child is able to do, what they're not able to do, right? And it gives us a better perspective now on kind of the educator point of view on 
some of the struggles, honestly, that they might see, right? We, as advocates, we're very hard on, 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 on school staff. We really are. We expect a lot out of them, the professionals, but we are also tough on our parents and we put a lot of pressure on them to step up and, and do what they have to do to ensure that their child's getting educated. And right now, the biggest part of that is gonna be data collection, right? We can't expect for the school to say, well, this child is here, this child is there, issue grades or update IEPs or do any of that without your input, right? We, we usually just get their input and what the school says the child is doing and that's what gets put in the IEP. But right now, all of the pressure for, for those of us who are gonna stay virtual, it, it, it's all gonna be on us. All of that reporting is gonna be on us. You know, and my daughter has already chosen like, um, like y'all were saying, my daughter's already chosen to go back uh, virtually. She's going to stay online and that's how she's going to begin the school year. And we're going to stay like that probably for a while. My son it will actually be back in school a lot sooner than everybody else. Maybe next week because they go uh, year round, you know, but it's a much different situation. A lot less people, a lot less exposure to, to outside. So, you know, we're, we're, we've got those two different areas, but the information that drives the IEP and all of the paperwork and their services and their therapies and everything else is going to be coming from us. We are the ones that's going to be able to tell them this is where we're at. We need to adjust. Hey, we're good right here or whatever else. So make sure you have a good data collection system. Ask, you know, during parent training to ask what that could look like. Google data collection or reach out to us and we can help you out with that. Perfect. And Ida, I just, because I, I kind of think that Juan answered that question, but I think he gave an answer that I think all of us would have would have kind of given, but specifically to you, Hida, what do you, what would you use just to give our audience a, an example of data collection? What does that look like? I want you to kind of talk us through maybe like briefly what that process looks like for you and what you would recommend for a quick data collection system because that just kind of popped in my head we all talked about data collection and like there's no right way to do it but then thinking about like visual learners what does that look like yes yeah, so we have different data sheets and especially for my kids i have two different systems that work for them very differently so for ricardo it's more of a daily tracking sheet that the communication log that comes home every day it goes and it comes um i see what are the things that he worked on during the day i can see if you know just the basic things for a kid who is unable to come and communicate how his day was whether he had something to eat or not whether he went to the restroom or not how he interacted with others how his day was um the how he was interacting with with staff or whether he used the device that he has and and whether he used that you know in initially initiating uh communication or with, did he respond and, and those kind of conversations that that he's unable to tell me on a day-to-day -day when he comes from home from school um but in addition to that it's also you know the comments that i'm able to write there um for the staff to know um, it's very clear for me to understand if he's coming home and he's having behaviors. You know, it's really a quick access for me to say, oh, he didn't eat today. He didn't feel good or he had trouble going to the restroom or there was a substitute. Things that for other people may not be so impactful for him, it would throw him off and I would see it and I wouldn't it would take me a while to figure out what what's wrong what does he need does he need to take a shower does he need to change his clothes is you know is is he upset or even just talking to him the fact that he can't talk doesn't mean he doesn't understand what i'm saying so i can you know kind of conversate with him and say oh you your your teacher wasn't there today you had a substitute oh i i guess you, that's why you're upset so now you're home let's take a break let's do something that you like let's give you you know a cup of ice and let's sit down and watch tv for a little bit and kind of just help him process through that with Leona, it's different. She can come home and she can have those conversations with me. So I don't need that, you know, day to day log of what's going on. But I do make notes when she does 
you know, say something like today I, I, I was crying or today I was really upset when I was, you know, working with such and such teacher or today I, I did something really good. My teacher helped me do that. So that kind of I, I, I email back and forth. But what I like about her data sheets is that I actually get the exact data sheet from her school what they're working on her on her goals. I, I request that and that comes home with her progress report. So not only is that progress report that comes home that says she's at 35% of meeting this goal, it tells me how did they get that 35%? What was it? You know, it's I'm able to see that. And one of the reasons why I think it's so good and you know, understanding what that looks like is because if we were tracking her reading level, you know, we're, we're, we're having her have a goal to meet her reading level or to answer questions in that specific reading level at 75% of the time, we get the first grading period and she's at 50 and then the, the next one she's at 80. Um, you know, we're kind of deviating from is she at 80% of the 75 or at 85% of the 100. So just putting it out there and, and making sure that we're clear on what that goal is is measured. But not only that, but knowing that her current reading level, you know, is she, she mastered, but then she moved on. So we're going to see a decrease in that percentage because the difficulty of the level went up. So, you know, for us to understand why in the beginning of the year she was doing so well and now she's doing so poor. Well, it's not really that. It's just that the, the levels were, were getting a little bit more difficult. So it just brings a little bit more of insight to the parents to understand this is what's really happening so that we're not questioning is it an effort on her behalf is it something that they're not doing um but it also shows us exactly you know i can see a lot more progress when there's a book that she's reading that is to her interest well if they're grading her on something that's about animals or something that's about you know some hands you know arts and crafts she's very interested in that so she's gonna try and read more yeah. than when you're giving her something you know that's not interesting to her so then we try and kind of put it in that manner to say okay give her a non-preferred reading and give her a preferred to see if she's you know averaging the same or is it just more on her preferred so it brings a lot of communication that di and dialogue with us with the staff so that we can kind of know not just she's doing okay she's doing good she's doing what we expect her to, to be doing but more in depth as to what does that look like so that when i'm home i can also provide her with some reading and see if she's reading at that level or not and if yeah. it's you know the, the prefer the preferred material or not so kind of giving us a little bit more um to understand and and it's different for every kid you know what do you want to know is it that you just are not involved you know or is it that you want to know more so it, it's also some parents don't take that credit and they say well the school knows more than i do no yeah. you are the expert of your child you know yeah, yeah. you can see that so you know i i don't like to rely on whatever the school says that's what i'm going to do the school is pretty much relying on you too well, what do you you know what are your interests i have exactly. parents who are very very good about you know saying i'm all for academics that's yes. i don't care if she has friends i don't care i i want her to learn how to read i want her to learn how to do this and then i have parents who are saying you know um, academics i i I'm, I'm good whatever she learns is fine but i i want social skills i want her interacting with people so it's really what's important to you what do you want to know more of so that's when you take data so that we know how do we support what works and what doesn't? And then we can come back and tweak it because we're going to do this all the time. We're going to come yeah. back and tweak. We're going to come back and change. We're gonna, it's not just one time and set in stone. No, exactly. And I think one of the, the big things to keep in mind is that it's an ongoing process. So there's not like, again, and I, I sound like a broken record, but there's no right and wrong way to collect data. But the point is, parents, you have to collect data. Like, again, more now than ever, you're kind of wearing two hats. You're you're the educator, you're the parent, um, but your your child's only going to be as successful in school as as you are in in taking that data and and giving the school feedback. Your kid's been out of school for five months. Uh, you can't expect the school to just figure it out. And and as a former teacher, and again, there's a reason why I'm an advocate. So I, again, I'm not biased towards teachers, obviously, but I do have a soft spot soft 
spot for teachers because I used to be one and it's not an easy job and it's it's definitely not easy right now, but you have to give the school some input. You have to put your part in and I've always been a firm believer in in, in this whole approach. And again, the, the law is written as such that it, it's a it's a committee. It's not one side. It's not one sided. Yes, in the past, in an ARD meeting, you might feel like, again, they're talking to you, not with you. Um, but team, things have changed. And I honestly feel that they've changed in a matter that that really puts parents in, in the driver's seat and really puts parents in, in the advantage. Because, again, there's nothing in law that has changed, but school has changed. But they're not telling you what what is going on anyway. So you can you can make it up as you go. There's nothing really that you can't ask for. And I think that Hida Sol's point about the data collection and, and just noticing these things within the changes in her daughter and her son, there's no right and wrong way. It's really about knowing your child, being with them for the last five months and giving the, the school an honest opinion on what's happening. Um, Juan, really quick, can you give me a little bit more about data collection? And then I wanna go ahead and answer these uh, great questions we have in our chat. And I think that'll wrap up our, our round talk nicely. Yeah, um, I wanted to give you guys an example of, of just how we collect data for Santana, if, if, if anybody's wondering, right? Keep it very simple, all right? Don't overcomplicate the data because yeah, it can get overcomplicated very fast, right? We use graphs a lot with him. So I'm gonna hopefully, my little index card comes in clearly. Okay, so we have the trials along the top and the tasks along the left side, right? And we have these little boxes to track and then this is what's inside of the box. All right, well, let me get there. Yeah, a plus or a minus. And as you go through one of those trials for the task, if he performs it correctly, give him a plus. If he does not, give him a minus. And we just go down the graphs like that, right? And you have different tasks. You have the amount of trials you want to try and, and talk to them and ask them, how many trials do you want me to attempt with him? Um, and really, you just determine how long you need to take. If, if your kiddo does things a little bit slower, they need they need more processing time, then that's fine. You know, know that you're going to be there for a little while. But for so for my daughter, anything that we do with her is going to have to be slow. She's super smart, but she's also super ADHD like that. Squirt, right? And she'll be gone in a heartbeat. And you know, talk about the pretty butterfly outside the window. So we know that we're going to have to give her more time with Santana. He's very fast. He wants to get it. He wants to get it done. Give me my work so I can get it done. So we're right there. We have everything ready for him. We have our data sheet there. We have, uh, you know, we have multiple data sheets just in case, you know, something gets spilled on it. Alex was talking about pudding earlier, and I can't stop thinking about pudding. I'm hungry now, but pudding might get spilled on it, right? So have have backups there. But find a way, right, just to reflect what your child is doing and what they're not doing right and and even whenever we have these little boxes with the with the checks and the minuses you can even put in the corner i for independent p for a prompt you know and then just set up a, a key or a legend on the bottom and explain what that data means whenever you report it back to the school but in doing that now you're giving your input and, and making sure that you know they are tracking what your child is doing no, I love it. And I, I love just the, again, visuals, right? Like just creating your own system that, that you can easily present to the committee and say, look, this has been working. You know, there's, again, there's nothing that's right or wrong, especially during this time. There's nothing outside of the scope of law that says you can or cannot do something like that or present that to the committee and even have it implemented in the IEP. So um, I love it, guys. Really quick, Nick Tay, is there anything about data collection that you want to add? Anything that you've been doing specifically for Alejandro that, that, that's been working for you guys? Just any any quick tip on data, and then I want to get to these questions that are in the chat. Um, nothing specific. I mean, I know you guys obviously have a, a, a big, a better system um, than we, we have set up as of now, but um, but really it's, for us, it's just been keeping track of what um, letters and numbers, because he's so little, what letters and numbers he does know and he doesn't know and he has trouble with, um, as well as certain triggers that I hadn't, um, I wasn't aware of he had until he started school. And so I've kind of been more observant of that. 
Um, and so so it's just kind of been keeping notes and so that way we can work with with his therapist or you know whoever we need to work with to help him succeed. But um, but yeah, I mean it, it's mostly just keeping track of of what where we're at, what level he's at. Great. Again, certain systems will work for you. You can figure out your own system. Um, again, there's nothing nothing right or wrong. So, well, thank you guys for sharing your your perspectives there. I think that whoever's listening to this is getting some really good knowledge and, and really good ideas. Uh, I want to go ahead and get our, our, our chat questions in. So uh, I'll just read them out and then whoever wants to tackle them, please go ahead. But the first one's from Jorge and he says, uh, what tips do you all have from a parent perspective to manage all at home? My own work, three kids online classes and assignments, their therapy, speech, ABS, and OT therapy, it feels since they closed the school, we the parents do it all and then some. Who wants to tackle that? I think, it, and I talked a little bit about this. Um, it's it's going to be a little bit you know, harder. It's gonna be different. And because we have full-time jobs, you know, that, that was one of the recommendation is, is trying to figure out first and foremost your kids are going to be home or, you know, are they going to go back to school as of September? What What is that going to look like? If they're going to stay home, then, you know, trying to figure out who is your support system. And what I mean by that is, you know, do you have, you know, grandma or family member, anybody that that is, you know, not working and is willing to be a supervision, you know, uh, adult in your home, you know, it, it's difficult but at the same time, it's what can you do if it's if there is no one? Sometimes there isn't anybody. If you're a, a, a you know single parent, or if your family lives away and you don't have anybody, then then you are all that they have. So what is that going to look like? We're going to have to figure out a way that that works for you. You know, so contacting the school and saying I don't have an adult to come and supervise my children. So you know, what is that going to look like? Can I? Um, you know, work with a school so that assignments are due at the end of the week. You know, what is that going to, um, you know, be for some of the kids? Are they old enough so that they can do online by themselves or how much support do they need? I have five children, so it is difficult. My husband works and I and and he works out of the home. I work inside of, of the home for now. Um, at some point we will return to the office and, and, and see what is that going to look like. So I do have some of the similar concerns that that you have, Jorge, but you know, for the meantime, we decided that the kids are not going to be going to school, you know, from here to December, and we've made those arrangements to have my mom come and and, and supervise. They may even if she's here, they may not be able to access school every day if it's you know at the same time because she's not able to do that. It's either supervising or you know watching them or feeding them or doing something like that. So it'll be something that is is a discussion with the staff once school starts and letting them know this is what our day looks like and how you know are the meetings all at the same time? Can we have a designated times for each kid? You know and and looking at that speech and OT you know um, are also virtual. Those are not working for my kid. Um, he does not like the virtual um, telehealth. It, it doesn't work for us. So we've had to kind of just say, OK, what can I do? So I've, I've taken that role. Um, but, you know, unfortunately and fortunately, we're, we're used to it. We, we've done it all along. We do it. We're kind of like walking, you know, therapists. We don't have the title, but we do everything that that there's they're supposed to be doing. Um, one of the things that we learn from through ECI and, and something that it also it's another program that, that Brighton provides is that, you know, we are trying to empower parents and we're trying to coach parents because at the end of the day, we are the ones that are going to have them and, and are, we're, their, their, um, we're the one person that they, they come back to. Therapists change, school staff changes. So if there's anything that's going to be the constant, it's going to be us. So we have to learn how to, you know, provide those therapies and see what that looks like. We have to be the ones to know exactly, OK, well, what are you learning? How are we going to do this? And, and making those tough decisions and saying, OK, well, this is something we can do and we can't. Um, one of the things that we had talked about is, you know, considering I know that retention is not 
you know, the, the best thing for everybody, you know, everybody feels like, oh, if they're going to retain my child, that's a super bad idea. I don't want to do that. Um, what is that going to look like? My kid's going to be, you know, fall behind or socially or emotionally, they're going to have a hard time, but perhaps this is a good year that we can consider saying, you know, there was so much change that maybe they need an extra year in that grade and, and see what that looks like next year. Um, so it's just something to put in your mind and, and, and to kind of consider what would that, let's see what that, what this year brings and, and see what the new changes, you know, if, if they help, if they don't, at least we'll know um, and consider if you want, you know, retention for the next year and, and see if, if that's something that your family is, is wanting to pursue. But again, just like Alex said, you know, we're here for you. If there's something that we want is to provide support to families and um, I, I grow very closely to the families that I serve. So we talk and we, you know, we have pre-ards after pre-ards. There's some that we have so many because we, we want to make sure that we catch up on everything and, and it's just allowing them to know these are the options. Think about it, see what you want to do, come back and we'll talk later and then we'll do it all over again. Let's see what the school says. Let's ask for these uh, supports. Is that something that we can do? Yes. Will they do it at the first time? Maybe not, but hey, we at this point, we're at a, in, in a position where even the schools are going to want to work with us. Yeah. They're also going to want to, you know, some kind of way say, well, I can't do it either. I have kids, so can I meet hey. after? So I think it's a good, you know, idea that we just bring those ideas to the table and see what the staff is willing to do as as far as working with us too. Absolutely. So. Biggest things that that I loved about what you just said here. So number one, empowering the families, right? Is yes, we provide advocacy services, but first and foremost, what we're trying to do is is give you guys the knowledge to be able to make those informed decisions to help your your kiddos. And then you as the lifelong advocate, giving you the tools to to be able to to fight for your kids. Um, and I think now, again, I keep saying it broken record, but more now than ever, you know, we have to dig deep and we, we have to pull more weight than we're accustomed to. I mean, it's just the reality of it. it you're going to have to be a little bit more involved. You're going to have to be up a little bit later at night. It's just the reality and the nature of the beast. And this is the, the hand that we've all been helped, uh, dealt. It, it's not easy, but again, going back to the beginning, you don't have to do it alone. There are a lot of people willing and able to help. Um, and, and so again, I know sometimes it feels like you're pulling more than your weight right now. You probably are, but you don't have to do it alone. And also communicate that with the school. They're not mind readers, the teachers, the administrators. If you don't tell them what's going on, they're not going to help you. So again, you have to voice your concerns. So thank you, Hirasol, for really harping on that. You, you have to be your child's biggest advocate, and we're trying to empower you. You, you know, you, we have to take the responsibility, we have to grit our teeth, and we have to dig deep. So thank you. Um, next question comes from Daisy Gutierrez. She says, my grandson will start this year at IDEA, Mays Public School. We love IDEA. Can you give some feedback on IDEA schools and special education? One, you work closely with IDEA. Uh, you've given many presentations at IDEA. You've worked closely with administrators at IDEA. Can you please give uh, Ms. Gutierrez a little bit of, of guidance? Yep. Come on, Coach. I'm going to give you the inside scoop. Okay, all their secrets. No, I'm kidding. So you, there, there's three things to sort of keep in mind with any school, right? Not just idea, but with any school. There's really three things that I try to keep in mind is collaborate, be creative, and keep good faith, right? Keep good faith that everybody involved has your child's best interests, or in this case, your grandson's best interests. But if they do not, Right, I wish you could have seen how dramatic that was when I flipped my little note card over like, but if they don't, right? Anyway, now there's three other things that I want you to, to, to keep in mind. One, inform yourself, all right? Read, 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 read. Reach out to us. Like Hirasol said, we have no problem with 
meeting with parents one after another after another several times emailing phone calls whatever whatever it takes to make sure that you are as well informed as possible to make the best decisions possible for your child second advocate for your child for your grandchild for the child that's in your care advocate for them don't there's nothing against you know advocating nothing that says that oh you can only advocate this much but not this much right the more you know the more you can speak their language right the special education lingo if you will the the, the abbreviations all the different acronyms the more that you can use that in your vocabulary whenever you speak with the school the more serious they are going to take you okay you have to give them a reason to take you serious okay and that doesn't mean you know getting cranked and take out my hearing we're about to do this but it means arming yourself up making sure that you know you know what your rights are and what your child's rights are it's extremely important and then if you do those two things you will see results okay you will see results with idea public schools I, you know I, I don't talk you know either way about schools specifically or even school districts but what i will say is that we work with uh, every single school district in bear county and now in some of the surrounding counties uh, and even now that it's virtual we are able to go to uh, some that are in the surrounding areas but we do provide professional development to several districts and idea is one of them right so that tells me from a higher leadership point of view that they are open to to knowing what it is that we come with right and that's what brighton center when we do speak you know and do professional developments with school districts, we tell them, look, we, we want to have good collaborative meetings. So I will tell you everything that I'm coming with when I come to the meeting. I'm asked for the data, I'm gonna ask for this, I'm gonna do this, 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 this. These are the things that I'm gonna do. We give them the answers. That way, when they are preparing, sort of going down the checklist, what they're doing is what's best for your child anyway. That's all we want is for them to keep your child's best interests at heart and make sure that all decisions are based off of that. Right, so just keep that in mind. Inform yourself, advocate, and don't stop. Get support if you need it from Brighton Center or anybody else, and you will see results. That's uh, that's what I got for that. Perfect. Thank you for for your feedback there, Juan. Um, we got about, and we got a little bit of time, uh, but I I, I want to get to this last question, Jorge. I know you had another question, but. In, in the sake of being fair to everybody, I want to get to Adam's question because it involves uh, ESY. And I know that's something that, that we've kind of discussed. So I'll, I'll read this question out and um, maybe I'll answer it. Maybe I'll give it to somebody. Let's see how I'm feeling at the end of this, but <laughs> uh, let's see. Our second grader in Northside District will be learning virtually this fall. Awesome. ESY provided him daily 30 minute sessions with a teacher virtually this summer to catch up on math skills he regressed with. These video sessions happened a few times a week in the spring and has and not as focused. Will this model of learning one on one virtually in the ALE setting be the new normal to meet goals? Reasonable to ask for designated 30 minute sessions from his teacher to reach his goals? More effective than all the apps? Thanks. Um, one thing quickly, and I'll just kind of touch upon the that last part. Is it reasonable to ask for designated 30 minute sessions from his teachers? If if you have the data to support that, if like that is how he's been re his or yeah, if he's been reaching his goals that way, absolutely. There's nothing to say that that you can't ask for that, especially if that's kind of been the it's from what you're saying seems like that's been happening already and, and that's the way that he's been making some progress because he's regressed there's absolutely nothing out of the question to say you cannot get those same 30 uh, minute sessions in fact from all of the arts that i've attended since march i have actually found that some districts once or twice in, in north side schools have actually been very accommodating to this idea of giving more one-on-one -on -one sessions because they have people on payroll that are kind of i don't want to say just sitting there but if people if if kids aren't in seats and people aren't getting pulled out of classrooms then that means that there's teachers that can get on a computer and set 30 minutes aside to service your child so again if your child is is, is accustomed to this and they've been making progress with this this is already in the iep or maybe it's not in the iep written explicitly 
call a NARD. Call a NARD like right before school starts and let's get this written into the IEP and, and you know, make this the norm for the school. And again, back to what I was saying earlier, there's nothing prohibiting you from bringing things to the table pre-COVID, during COVID. This is just standard practice. You as, as your child's expert, you can bring anything to the table really that you'd like and it's up to the committee to accept it or not. And you being the loudest voice of that committee. So I would say, yeah, that can absolutely be the norm. Just come prepared. As Juan and Hidasola kind of said, have your data ready, prepare that data, present your data in an articulate way, and they will be more happy to meet you halfway. Now, if they're going to push back and, and be jerks about it, then give us a call and we'll come and, and beat them up for you. Not joking. We're very amicable and we really don't like to burn bridges. Um, but honestly, if you are having trouble with that, I would say give us a call. Um, do we have, before I, actually, before we go to that, do you guys have anything to add to that question? Because I think it's really pertinent, you know, going from ESY to the school year, it's always looked different. But I think there's an argument to be made, and I don't care if we go a little bit over. Boss, do you care if we go a little over? Five minutes? <laughs> I think there's an argument to be made to say, well, there's a lot of regression that's happening, right? And ESY is always like that one thing where they look at regression and they say it has to be through a school year. It's like schools, there's been no school. Kiddo is receiving ESY. Um, let's not, why don't we just ex extend the type of services that they get during ESY through the school year? Guys, do you have anything to add to that? Is, would that be something that you would fight for? I would definitely say that with this question, this is the reason why we collect data. This is the reason why we need to do our part to say, OK, this is how, um, you know, what I have in a shape of, of documentation, this date, this date, this date, you know, she did, he didn't meet um, his goal because it's one thing for us to just express and say, well, I haven't seen it, I haven't seen it, but it's different when we show it on paper and say it's, I'm not using it, you know, just to have an argument and to make sure that you give me more time. But if we look at it, you know, they want to give our kids, you know, services, enough services just for them to make some progress. That's, that's really what makes us, you know, that as a parent and as an advocate that we, we're not just wanting them to make that little progress to show that they're learning. We want them to meet those goals. Those goals were there. We all are, uh, agreed to have this goal and to have a specific percentage of that goal be met for a reason. And if we initially thought that this kid was supposed to, you know, master 75%, then that's the expectation and we shouldn't have to, you know, lower it down if the expectation we all felt was reasonable and achievable. So if anything that data should support, well, you know, ESY, they met with this um, student for 30 minutes once a week and we didn't get much. We only, you know, have 30 or 40 percent. Well, that's not sufficient. Then we need two 30 minutes. And if we have two to 30 minutes and we need to three, you know, we need the minutes that is that are going to make this goal get, you know, the student gets the 75% or to the 80%, whatever the, the percentage was. So this is the reason why data is useful because data is going to get us services the same way that data is going to say we don't need services. So it can you be used both ways. We just need to have some form of representation. So it's not just our word against theirs. It's not, we're not using it, you know, in, in a manner where we're just arguing and, and going at a challenge. You know, every time we we get to an art meeting and we see these arguments, we as advocates say, okay, everybody has different perspectives. Everybody has different opinions. Let's just remove all that. Show us the data. What does the data say? If the data says that this child is not making progress, then you don't have the the paperwork and the documentation needing, you know, su to support that we don't have um, the appropriate services. So that data is really what we always go back to. If we have good data that says that, you know, we need more or we need less or we need to change it or it's not sufficient, that that's really the, the most valuable thing out of anything. If you're going to take away from this session is take your own documentation so that you have something to prove. Um, my son, Ricardo, 
Um, he goes to school. He loves the bus. He loves doing all of these things. But, you know, he, and he loves technology. I mean, he has an iPad. He can work YouTube better than I can. He knows how to change cartoons and back and forth. And he even knows how to charge his iPad because he, that's something that he is so, you know, engaged in. But you know, so you would think that, you know, virtual meetings would be his thing. But no, it's not. He doesn't want to see his teacher on the, on the camera. He wants to see his videos, his Thomas the Trainer, you know, whatever it is that he's watching. So although he has a very good, you know, engaging, um, you know, behavior into technology, it's about what he wants to see. So we, I had to say, yes, he likes to have his iPad. He just doesn't want to see you. He doesn't want to work. He, he knows that he wants to use it for, you know, leisure time and not for academics. So that's, you know, I had to literally put him on the video so that they would see how he would get so upset and say, this is, this is us trying to have him, you know, engage into virtual learning. So it's not working. So what else can we do? So we tried it, you know, because like, also, we can't just say one time is, is more than enough. We tried it a couple of weeks and, and because we didn't see any progress, it was just getting worse and worse. And I wasn't going to be chasing him around the house with the iPad so that he would engage in, in some virtual learning. We decided that that wasn't going to be the, the best method. So they ended up giving us and mailing um, some activities for him, dropping off activities so they would be hands on. So use that documentation for whatever it is that you feel is a need. It's not just to have documentation to have it as, you know, this is what he's doing, but it's going to serve as as for many reasons. We can say, well, it took him two weeks to learn this. It took him three weeks or it we've been doing this for four months and it's not working. So that that's how we use the data and we, how we can always go back to remaining objective and removing all of those feelings that we have against people and staff um, and, and just be objective so that we can get the child the correct services. I think that's perfect, right? Like removing the objectivity or removing the subjectivity and remaining objective about what's best for a child, right? And, and you, you nailed it, you know, bringing in your own data. That's why we collect data is, is to use it in our favor when we're trying to fight for services that we feel are appropriate to our child's needs. So I think that was a perfect answer. Uh, Juan or Nick, do you have anything to add to that? Um, you know, anything real quick, and then we can go ahead and, and, and wrap this thing up. Yeah, um, just to kind of wrap up for, for everything, right? For any question that's out there, for any doubts or concerns, um, I, what I will say is don't settle. Do not settle. OK, if you feel like, oh, well, I keep bugging the school and I feel bad and this and that. Absolutely not. One, it's their job. Right. But two, you have a lot of educators that really do care. Right. And if you have an educator that does not care, we're going to make them care. Again, we got to make them take us seriously. Right. What you do that is to persist. Right. Persistence beats resistance. Do not settle because you're not just thinking about your second grader or your third grader or whatever you're thinking about your child at 25 or 30 years old, right? What are we doing right now that's going to set them up for the future? You have to get into that mindset and think about long term. And then when you when you get that picture, then you can start planning the, the short term sort of benchmarks to get there, right? But don't settle, guys. Do not settle. Adjust and, and persevere through this. And just remember that uh, persistence beats resistance. Perfect. I love that. Persistence beats resistance. I really do like that. And again, I, you know, I, I keep thinking back to what I wrote down earlier, but you know, adversity is 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 your norm. It's it's you're used to this. So, you know, there's some uncomfortable adjustments that we all have to make, but I think in the end, you know, you're not alone in this. And and that's a real big takeaway for me that I that I heard from you guys and and again, thank you for sharing your perspectives. Each one of you have so much to share, so much knowledge and, and, and so much insight. Thank you so much. Um, before we go, I just want to make sure that we, we, for those of you watching, that we give you our contact information in case you want to schedule uh, a pre-ARD uh, consultation with one of us. You'll be assigned an advocate based on where your child goes to school, based on the district and based on geographic location. Uh, Nick Tate, do you have the the CES hotline that rings right at Juan's phone. 
<laughs> yes, um, so I'll go ahead and give you all our main number. It is 210-826-4492. Um, once again, it's 210-826-4492. Um, you can also fill out a form. We have one on our website. Um, once you go to our to where the special education advocates are, you can fill it out there or we also have an email. Um, it says program at brightonsa.org. That's S E S S program at brightonsa.org. Um, so you can reach us in many ways and um, you can if you do call the main number, you can always leave us a voicemail. Um, we'll usually get to you within the same day. Um, right now is the perfect time to book because we're at the beginning. Uh, we're barely going to start the year, so um, it's it's a good time to get everything set up and, and get established with the advocate if you're not established with one already. Um, so um, once again, we have our website, which is www.brightonsa.org um, and the phone number is 210-826-4492. 8264492 is that it yes that is right. it we need a, we need a jingle is what i'm i'm gathering from this whole thing but anyway thank you everybody for for taking time out of your precious day to be here i know that time is of you know we're we're shortage of time not, not enough time to do what we need to do so very thankful for for those that, that joined us thankful for everyone uh, on the panel today my lovely colleagues i love your faces i miss you dearly to be in the flesh with you guys. Um, Hirasol, Juan, Nick Tay, Holly, thank you all for, for being here this evening. Uh, and all of you, please st stay safe out there. Um, and hopefully we'll do one of these again soon. So everybody have a good night. <laughs>